During this session, we're going to be looking at a comparison of financial accounting and management accounting. We're going to be looking at the types of organizations and then we into the whole area of cost classification. Now, most persons would have already covered financial accounting in semester one or have already done financial accounting in some previous course. In this course, cost and management accounting, we are looking at accounting for management. Accounting for management. So here, for the most part, we're going to be looking at tools that management uses to assist them in making what we call short-term tactical decisions. Now, basically, we have two types of accounting. We have the accounting, the field of accounting that you are accustomed to, which is financial accounting. And then we have the field that we are going to be looking at this semester, which is management accounting. Now let's look at some basic differences between these two. That is financial accounting on the one hand and management accounting on the other hand. The first thing is that financial accounting focuses on the external users. That is on persons who are going to be making decisions about the entity. And the decisions that persons tend to make about the entity is whether they invest in the entity or from a lender's perspective, whether the business is viable enough for them to lend to the business. Management accounting, on the other hand, is actually accounting for internal users. And these internal users, they make decisions for the entity. Next, when preparing financial accounting statements, whatever we do must be expressed in terms of dollars and cents. Management accounting, on the other hand, focuses on both monetary and non-monetary items. In a little while, when we look at cost classification, we'll look at that a bit closer, monetary and non-monetary events. Next, financial accounting, because of its very nature, we are doing we are actually preparing statements for outsiders. Therefore, these statements must be prepared in accordance with certain rules. These rules are referred to as generally accepted accounting principles, that is GAAP. As a result of this, the statements prepared for financial accounting purposes are said to be objective. Management accounting statements, on the other hand, as I said before, Management accounting is accounting for management. So it therefore means that these statements are done in accordance with what management wants. And as a result of that, we say that management accounting statements are therefore subjective. As far as financial accounting is concerned, if we go back to financial accounting that we did last semester or that we have done before, Normally, when we are doing the income statement, for example, it says income statement for period ended. And that period is normally one year or an accounting period. Now, management accounting, on the other hand, we don't have to wait until the year end to do our statements. We do statements, we say, on demand. When management wants a statement, that's when they get it. Now, because the financial accounting statements are done up in accordance with certain rules, the fact is, take for example, entities that are listed on the exchange, these companies are required to file their financial statements. They are, it's a government require, regulation that they have to file, file their financials. These financial statements should be verifiable. That is to say, an auditor should be able to come in and verify that what the financial statements say, that they are saying, they are really saying that. In terms of management accounting, there is no independent audit that is required. Because remember that in terms of management accounting, we are doing the statements according to what management wants. So 
Nobody has to verify what we are doing. In terms of financial accounting also, it makes use of historical data. If you remember the heading for, say, your income statement, it says income statement for period and debt. In other words, we take the historical data, and that is what we used to do of the financials. Therefore, it is said that financial accounting is backward looking. Management accounting, on the other hand, uses historical data, but we also make projections. As a result of that, we say that management accounting is forward looking. And lastly, when we're doing up on financial statements, we always do the financials for the entire entity. When it comes on to management accounting, what we tend to do is to do the statements for each arm of the organization. And each arm is required to, is referred to, sorry, either as a department or as a cost center. So those are the basic differences between financial accounting and management accounting. Next, we turn to look at the types of business organizations. We have three types of business organizations. Firstly, we have what are called service organizations. Now, these organizations tend to offer something that is intangible, a service that is intangible. As a result of this, this service, these organizations are only said to be labor intensive. Service organizations carry no inventory. Typical examples of service organizations would be like your law firms, your accounting firms, your hospitals, like your IT companies, like your cellular phone companies. These would all fall under service organizations. They are labor intensive, they carry no inventory. Next, we have what are called businesses. Now, what happens in a merchandising business is that the merchandiser buys finished products and we sell these at a profit. Now this profit is referred to as a markup. Now this term markup, we need to understand the difference between markup and margin. Markup is profit expressed as a percentage of cost. Margin is profit expressed as a percentage of selling price. Now, later on in the course, we're going to visit, revisit these two terms, markup and margin. So when we see costs, we think of markup. Selling price, we think of margin. Now, a merchandising business by its very nature, because the merchandiser buys and sells finished products, the merchandising business carries one inventory, and that one inventory is referred to as finished goods or merchandise inventory. So let's remind ourselves, the first type of business organization, the service organization, labor intensive, carries no inventory. Second, the merchandising business, which the merchant buys and sells finished product, carries one inventory, and that is merchandise inventory. Now, the third type of, type of organization is the one that we are going to be focusing on very heavily in the first section of the course, especially. And these are manufacturing business. Now, in the case of manufacturing business, the manufacturer is going to buy the raw material, then he's going to apply labor and machinery to convert that raw material into finished goods. So here then, by its very nature, if the manufacturer is going to buy raw material and then he's going to work on that raw material to transform it into finished goods, it means that unlike the merchandiser, which carries one inventory, a manufacturer is going to be carrying more than one inventory. Remember, they buy raw material. So therefore means at the end of the day, you could have some unused raw material. They are making finished goods. So at the end of the day, the manufacturer could have some 
finished items as well. And thirdly, because the manufacturer is making items, no doubt at the end of the period, the manufacturer is going to also have some unfinished units. It therefore means that a manufacturing business carries three inventories, raw material, finished goods, and work in progress. Examples of manufacturing businesses would be like a garment making business, the food and beverage industry, and any other furniture making business. These are all manufacturers. Any entity that buys raw material and then converts it into finished goods is referred to as a manufacturing business. From financial accounting, we know that inventory is reflected in the balance sheet of the entity under the current asset section. So by just looking at a balance sheet, we should be able to tell the type of business that is being operated. So in the case of a merchandising business, on the current assets, we will have things like our cash or receivables or prepaid expenses, and then we would have our finished goods inventory. In the case of the manufacturing business, which carries three inventories, under the current asset section, we'll also have our cash, receivable, and prepaid expenses. But in addition to that, we would have the three inventories. That is our raw material of work in progress and our finished goods. So just reviewing those three, we have three types of businesses. Service organization, they carry no inventory. We have merchandising businesses that carry one inventory, and that's finished goods inventory. And then thirdly, we have manufacturing businesses. They carry three inventories. These are raw material, working progress, and finished goods. First, I'll look at how we go about calculating cost of goods sold from a merchandiser's perspective and from a manufacturer's perspective. From a merchandising business's point of view, cost of goods sold is calculated in the same manner that we calculated cost of sales in financial accounting. That is, cost of goods sold is equal to our beginning finished goods inventory plus our net purchases minus our ending finished goods inventory. Recall that in the case of a merchandising business, the merchandiser buys finished products and then sells them to make a profit. So cost of goods sold for the merchandiser is the beginning finished goods inventory plus the net purchases minus the ending finished goods inventory. From a manufacturer's perspective, cost of goods sold, remember that in the case of the manufacturer, the manufacturer is making the items and then selling them. Therefore, from a manufacturer's perspective, cost of goods sold is equal to beginning finished goods inventory plus cost of goods manufactured minus ending finished goods inventory. In looking at these two formulas, therefore, calculating cost of goods sold for the merchandiser and in calculating cost of goods sold for the manufacturer, remember for the merchandiser, cost of goods sold is beginning finished goods inventory plus your purchases minus your ending finished goods inventory. Whereas for the manufacturer, cost of goods sold is the beginning, same finished goods inventory, but this time plus the cost of goods manufactured minus the ending finished goods inventory. We could therefore say that cost of goods manufactured for the manufacturer is equivalent to the purchases for the merchandiser. Let me say that again. Cost of goods manufactured for the manufacturer is 
equivalent to purchases for the merchandiser. Now, the next question is, how do we arrive at cost of goods manufactured? Now, recall that the manufacturer carries three inventories, finished goods, raw material, and work in progress. Now, if we want to work out the cost of the units made by the manufacturer, Remember, in practical terms, at the start of the accounting period, the manufacturer would have had some unfinished units. So in this current accounting period, they would finish up those units and then go on to make in some new units. Then at the end of the accounting period, we would still have some unfinished units to deal with. It therefore means that from the manufacturer's perspective then, cost of goods manufactured must be equal to beginning work in progress plus total manufacturing costs minus the ending work in process. So cost of goods manufactured is equal to beginning WIP plus total manufacturing costs, abbreviated TMC, minus the ending WIP. Now, the question is, what is total manufacturing costs? To answer this, we have to look at the area of cost classification. So let us now turn to the whole area of cost classification. Now, let us see if we can clarify what we mean by cost classification in management accounting. Let's take those two words, starting with classification. When we think about classification, classification is really grouping items that have some similarity. Mm -hmm. So we group items that are similar. Cost. Now, when we see the word cost, we tend to think of dollars and cents. But remember when we looked at the differences between financial accounting and management accounting, I said to you that one of the main differences is that financial accounting deals strictly with monetary items, whereas management accounting makes use of both monetary and non-monetary items. So it therefore means that as far as we are concerned, cost goes beyond dollars and cents. Let's use a typical example. Let us say that I go into a store and want a pair of shoes. And I say to the store clerk, what's the cost of this? And they say $5,000, 5,000 Jamaican dollars, that is. In order for me to get that pair of shoes, I'll have to give them my $5,000 and they give me the pair of shoes. So I need the object. I give the money, I get that object. But take your being in school. You're here to get a tertiary level education. That's your objective. Mm -hmm. Now, to achieve this objective, not only do you have to pay money for each credit hour, but you have to be making a lot of sacrifices in other regards. Take, for example, to attend your teleconferences, you have to leave your families, go to the sites. Perhaps by the time, for those of us who are mothers, by the time we get home, our children are fast asleep. Maybe in the morning, by the time they are up, we're already gone. To achieve the objective of the education, therefore, not only are we paying money, but there is something in economics that they call opportunity cost. It is costing us our family time. It's costing us time that we will spend with our friends, relaxing. And it is costing us money. So therefore, in management accounting, 
we define cost as what has to be given up in order to acquire an object or to achieve an objective. That is cost for us. What we have to give up in order to get something. That something is either an object or to achieve an objective. So that for us is cost classification. Now, we have different ways of grouping our costs or classifying our costs. We could classify our costs based on the functional area under which they fall. We could group them based on product. Thirdly, we look at costs in terms of how they behave in relation to changes in activity or production volume. From a management perspective, we could look at the costs in terms of the degree of control that we as managers have over them. And fifthly, from a management perspective in making decisions, we could look at these costs in terms of how relevant they are in the decision-making process. Now, in this course, we are going to be looking at the first three groupings. Grouping based on function, grouping based on product, and grouping based on production volume. Let's look at the first grouping, grouping based on function. And these refer to as functional costs. Now, in a manufacturing concern, the main function is the production function. And so we speak to what are called production or manufacturing costs. Now, how do we define production or manufacturing costs? These are the costs that we incur to convert raw material into finished goods. And that, of course, is inclusive of the raw material cost. So our production costs are all the costs that we incur from raw material to finished goods. Next, we have what are called administrative costs. Now, our admin costs, we can say in a nutshell, are our everyday running costs as far as the organization is concerned. So let us say that we have a photocopy machine that we use in the admin office that we pay rental for. That would be an admin cost. The administrative workers, the clerks that we have working in the admin area, their salaries, that's an admin cost. We have to buy stationery and supplies for our workers to use. That would also be admin costs. Somebody has to run a little errand and you have to give them a taxi fare to go. That's part of your admin costs. So your administrative costs are your everyday running costs. And these costs are incurred. It doesn't matter the type of organization that you're operating. Administrative costs would always be there. Then we have what are called selling costs. What do we mean by selling costs? Selling costs are the costs that we incur either to stimulate interest in either the product or the service that we are offering. So take, for example, that we have um, a catalog. For example, we are selling furniture and we have a catalog that we use. The cost of those, let's say we place an ad on the TV. That's also selling cost. Let's say we have salespersons who go out to get persons to buy the product or to buy into the service. The, those costs are all part of our selling costs. Next, we have what are called distribution costs. Distribution costs are the costs that we incur from the items reach the finished goods stage until they get to the consumer who is the end user of the product. So listen carefully. For distribution costs, remember these are from finished goods to consumer. So let us say that after we are finished making the product, we put them in a warehouse, a storage area. And we have to pay rental for that warehouse. The rental for the warehouse is going to be part of your distribution costs. Has to be. Let us say that the warehouse has been used to store both raw material and finished goods. Raw material relates to production. Finished goods, the items are already finished. So it therefore means 
In that case, the rental for the warehouse would have to be shared between production and distribution. Production for the raw material component, distribution for the finished goods component. In an examination context, the examiner would have to tell you how that rental should be shared. Take, for example, they'll say 60% should go to production, 40% to distribution, or they could tell you in terms of the space, what space is used for raw material and what space is used for finished goods, and you would have to prorate the cost accordingly. But we'll come across a couple of practical examples later on. Next, we have what are called research and development costs. Now, depending on the nature of the business, you could have these costs. Let us say it's your, for example, working in a chemical industry. Research and development costs, these are costs that you incur to improve the quality of the product that you are making. So this R&D cost would be unique to some organizations. But the fact is, your admin costs, your selling costs, your distribution costs, those would always be there. R&D, sometimes depending on the nature. Now, your admin, selling, distribution, and R&D costs combined, if the R&D are there, are referred to as non-production costs. So clearly then we can see that our functional costs are really in two, two sets. You have on the, in one set production costs and you have in the other set non-production costs. So when we speak to non-production costs, we are talking about our admin, selling, distribution, and R&D costs. Okay, so that's the first grouping. Next, we turn to look at the second grouping. That is grouping based on product. So we have looked at functional costs. Now we're looking at product costs. Now, as far as product costs are concerned, product costs are also referred to as production costs. And in some instances, they are referred to as manufacturing costs and even sometimes referred to as factory costs. So those terms are used interchangeably. Now, as far as product costs are concerned, remember the, pro the definition of production costs. These are the costs that we incur to convert raw material into finished product. Now, there are two types of product costs. We have what are called direct product costs, and we have what are called indirect product costs. Now, whether a cost is direct or indirect, has to do with its traceability. That is, when we are given a product cost, we ask ourselves the question, is it economically feasible for us to trace this cost to the finished product? If the answer is yes, it is a direct cost. If the answer is no, it is an indirect product costs. So we have what are called direct product costs. We have what are called indirect product costs. Now, as far as product costs are concerned, we say that the main elements of production costs are direct material, sometimes referred to as raw material, direct labor, and manufacturing overheads. Now, sometimes, instead of saying the main elements of production costs are, they will say the main elements of the inventoriable cost. Note the word, inventoriable cost of a manufactured product are direct material, direct labor, and manufacturing overheads. Inventoriable cost is the same as production cost. Uh -huh. Notice the root word there in that term is inventory. So the main elements of production cost or the main elements of the inventoriable cost of a manufactured product are direct material, direct labor, and manufacturing overheads. 
It therefore means that we can say production cost is equal to direct material plus direct labor plus manufacturing overhead using those main elements. Now, we say main elements because sometimes you could come across something that is referred to as direct expenses. Let, now, let me explain the term direct expenses and how they can come about. Let us say that you are making a piece of furniture and you need a design in order for you to make that piece of furniture. The cost of the design is referred to as a direct expense. Let us say that you are making some item and in order for you to make those items you have to hire a unique piece of equipment to use the higher edge cost of that piece of equipment would be deemed to be a direct expense let us say like you're in the chemical industry and you are borrowing somebody's formula you're using a formula that somebody developed to make your product it would mean that you'd have to pay that person royalty the royalty payments in that regard would be referred to as a direct expense. So it therefore means I'm saying to us that direct expenses could be there, but they are not always there. That is why they are not referred to as a main element. But the direct material, the direct labor, the manufacturing overheads are always there. So using the main elements of production cost, production cost is equal to direct material, plus direct labor, plus manufacturing overheads. Now, the sum of all direct costs is referred to as the prime cost of the product. The sum of all direct costs is referred to as the prime cost of the product. So it means, therefore, that prime cost is equal to direct material plus direct labor. It therefore means that we would calculate production cost a second way. Instead of saying that production cost is equal to direct material plus direct labor plus manufacturing overheads, we could say that production cost is equal to prime cost plus manufacturing overheads. Next, remember how we define production costs. We said that production costs are the costs that we incur to convert raw material into finished goods. Recall that the main elements of production costs are direct material, direct labor, and manufacturing overheads. Direct material, remember, is the same thing as your raw material. So it means, therefore, Using the main elements, we can say that conversion cost is equal to your direct labor cost plus your manufacturing overheads. If that is the case, it means, therefore, that we could calculate production cost a third way. And that is to say production cost is equal to direct material plus the conversion cost. Recall the definition. Production costs are the costs that we incur to convert material to finished product. So production costs must be the material cost plus the conversion cost. So note there that we have three ways of calculating production costs. On the one hand, production costs, direct material plus direct labor plus manufacturing overheads. Secondly, Production cost is equal to prime cost plus manufacturing overheads. And thirdly, production cost is equal to direct material plus your conversion cost. Conversion cost. So summarizing what we just did, first we start off with total cost, looking at the functional cost. The main function we say is our production function. Then we say we have our administrative costs. We have our selling costs we have our distribution costs. We said that the sum of the admin selling distribution, those costs combined, we say are non-production costs. 
or we could say they are non-production overheads because they are all indirect costs and all indirect costs are referred to as overheads. So they are non-production overheads. Then for the production costs, grouping based on product, we say that we have what are called direct product costs and we say we have what are called indirect product costs. From the direct costs, we say we have direct material, we say we have direct labor. We said that the sum of the direct cost is equal to the prime cost. And then the indirect costs are referred to as our production overhead. And finally, we said that when we add together direct labor and our production overhead, we arrive at conversion costs. So this then is a summary of all that we just did under the first two groupings. That is grouping based on function and grouping based on product. Now putting this in a statement form, you could be required to do what is, what is called a cost summary. So let's put this together in the format of the cost summary. First we have our direct material costs, then we add our direct labor costs. If there are direct expenses, remember that these are not always there. But if there are direct expenses, we add them in. The sum of all the direct costs, we say, is equal to the prime cost of the product. Then we are going to add our production or manufacturing overheads. That takes us up to production cost. Then we are going to add our non-production overheads. That is our selling costs or distribution costs or administrative costs. The total of these will be added to our production costs. And that takes us up to total cost. So that is a typical cost summary. So having looked at that, let us now go to a question. Because we have now covered the theory underlying the first two groupings. Let us now apply that theory to a question. And so let us look at question four from worksheet one. Now first, we are going to look at the list of costs given and identify the functional area under which each would fall. The first cost that we have there is advertising. Advertising would be classified as a selling cost. Next, we have assembler's wages. Assemblers, these are the persons who are going to be working on the raw material to make the finished product. So, assemblers' wages is classified as a direct labor cost. Next, we have production supervisor's salary. Production supervisor's salary is going to be classified as a factory overhead or a manufacturing overhead or a production overhead, whichever of the three terms you want to use. Next, we have depreciation of machinery, and we're assuming here that it is the production machinery, so that would be classified as a factory overhead. Next, we have factory utilities. Factory utilities is also classified as a factory overhead. Next, we have lath operators' wages. Lath machine operators' wages, these are persons who are operating this machine that we use to deal with the, the wood that is used to make the doors and windows. So since these persons are working directly on the raw material, their wages would be a direct labor cost. Next, we have machine repairs. Machine repairs, here we're assuming that it is a production machinery. So machine repairs would be classified as a factory overhead. Next, we have office salaries. This is the salaries of the office staff. So these are the admin personnel. So therefore, office salaries would be classified as an administrative cost. Next, we have purchase of glue and purchase of screws and nails, these are both going to be classified as factory overhead. Next, we have purchase of pine. 
and purchase of oak. These are the raw materials that are being used to make these windows and doors. So therefore, pine and oak are both direct material costs. Now let us look at the requirements. The first thing that we're asked to calculate is the direct material used. Direct material used. Now, let me point out from now that there is a difference between direct material used and direct material purchased. But later on, we will clarify that further. Now, to arrive at the direct material used, let's look at the listing that we have there. The direct materials are purchase of pine for 99,000 and purchase of oak for 250,000. We say direct material use would be equal to the 99,000 for the pine plus the 250,000 for the oak. And that gives us a total of 349000 Next, they ask us to work out the direct labor costs. So once again, we go back to our listing and identify all the costs that we labeled as direct labor. And looking at the list, the direct labor costs that we identified were the assembler's wages and the last machine operator's wages. So that would be 84,200 plus the 664. So direct labor cost then is 150,600. Next, they ask us to work out the factory overhead. So back to our list of costs, all the costs that we labeled as factory overhead, these are going to come together now in response to part C. So the factory overhead would be the sum of the production supervisor's um, salary, the depreciation, the factory utilities, machine repairs, purchase of glue, and purchase of screws and nails. So when we add those together, we get a total of 111200. Next, Part D asks us to work out the prime cost of the product. Now, based on the theory, remember we said in the theory that the main elements of production cost are direct material, direct labor, and manufacturing overheads. And we also said that as far as the main elements are concerned, the sum of the direct costs is referred to as the prime cost of the product. So in this case then, this example that we are doing, prime cost will be the sum of the direct material used and the direct labor cost. So direct material used is 349, direct labor is 15600. So we add those two together and we get our prime cost of 499600. Next, we are asked to work out conversion cost. Now, based on the main elements of production costs, remember that conversion cost is the sum of all the costs other than direct material. So, since the main elements of production costs are direct material, direct labor, and manufacturing overheads or factory overheads, it means that conversion cost in this case would, this, would be the sum of our direct labor cost and our factory. Overheads. So then conversion cost is direct labor plus factory overhead. So direct labor cost is 15600 Factory overhead is 111200 We add those two together and we get our conversion cost of 261.8. Now the final part of this question asks us to work out production cost. Now if we go back to our theory, remember that we had three different ways of working out production cost. Uh -huh. Remember we said production cost is a sum of direct material, 
direct labor and manufacturing overheads. That is, of course, using the main elements of production costs. So here then, in our workings, direct material costs is 349,000, direct labor is 15600 and manufacturing overheads is 111200 so we could sum those three together and we get our production cost of 610800 alternately we could say production cost is the sum of our prime cost plus our manufacturing overheads or our factory overhead so therefore remember our prime cost we already calculated and we know what our manufacturing overhead is which we also had calculated so it therefore means we could say that production cost is prime cost of 4.99.6 plus the manufacturing overheads of 111 200 and there that will also take us back to 610800 now remember the third one i'm going to ask you to do the third one because remember the third method to work out production cost we could say production cost is equal to direct material used plus our conversion costs so do that in your time and it should take you right back to 6 hundred and ten thousand eight hundred dollars so there guys we have seen how we go about applying the um, concepts in relation to looking at the main elements of production cost looking at prime cost looking at conversion cost